Good evening, uh, and welcome to the World Land Trust's uh, evening on controversial conservation. Um, I'm Alistair Gamble. Uh, I'm a member of the Council of the World Land Trust and a former director of International at RSPB before I retired. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists um, to you. Um, we have uh, Gary uh, Marvin uh, right at the, the end. Um, I have Mark Avery next along from us, Bill Oddy, um, John, so, <laughs> Andrew, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, Andrew Gilruth from uh, uh, Game, Game and Wildlife uh, Conservation Trust. Um, we have John Burton and Chris Packham. Um, the topic of uh, the uh, evening is, uh, is uh, killing birds uh, justified? It was chosen because uh, it is evident that there are disparate views on that, but we believe some sort of consensus can be developed uh, and uh, uh, that uh, there is potential for considerable common ground, and that is the objective, is to find that common ground. Um, one of the panelists, I should have mentioned that one of the panelists, uh, jo James Barrington, or was going to be a panelist, but he is no longer a panelist, and, but I believe he is in the audience, so uh, our program is slightly shortened. And also that we did invite a uh, representative of the Maltese High Commission to come tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they declined. But I should say, in defence of Malta, that they are not the only person in the, or not the only country in the frame, including our own. Um, uh, I'm also aware that some people wanted to include issues surrounding uh, badger controls, fox hunting, and other issues uh, relating to mammals, uh, but we felt that just birds alone was a big enough subject, and therefore we would concentrate just on the bird killing issue. Um, because uh, uh, these topics are controversial, um, I, and I know many of you will want to speak uh, when we come to question time, I do want to try to keep to time, and I want to try to, uh, well, I need your help, essentially, asking questions, not making speeches, um, and uh, giving uh, the panel time to, to uh, discuss this. So that will come after the interval, and I will remind you of that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, can I introduce uh, Chris Packham uh, to start the evening off? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for giving up your time this evening to come along. Um, I'm one of a green blob of unelected busybodies. I'm very proud of that position that I've earned for myself, a democratic uh, right of mine to speak my views based on uh, various opinions and uh, ideas formulated through science in the, in the main. Um, I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm one, that sounds it's too singular. I, I'm one of a, a collective of conservationists that I suppose is impatient to see some radical change and some more, uh, more progress than we currently have. I, I feel very often that conservation is neither optimising or maximising its ability to make that change. Maybe it's because I'm an old punk rocker. Um, but I therefore you know, um, spend my time not only uh, voicing opinions which might oppose that of I, and I lose the term usually, uh, my adversaries, but also my colleagues, uh, which is often um, seems to be unpalatable to them. I, I don't think it's unfair to criticise conservation. Uh, we're not doing everything right, otherwise there would be no need for us to be here this evening, would there? Um, so I think sometimes it needs to kick up the arse. And it was this very conversation that I had with John uh, a couple <laughs> of years ago, and we came up with this idea of, tonight, controversial conservation. Although I struggle to see what's controversial about some of it, really, uh, to be quite honest with you. It seems common sense to me, but then that's why we've got two sides to the argument. Um, very often, conservation is conservative with a small c. It seems to be a terribly risk-averse movement, as it stands at the moment, um, despite its failings, and this puzzles me. 
So we were chatting over lunch near Q, and we thought, why not provide a platform and provide some profile for a few ideas which are the sorts of things that we all sit around and talk about in bird hides, pubs or clubs, but, frequent, uh, but only infrequently dare to mention when we're out and about in, in company. So we came up with this title of Controversial Conservation, and we have several things on our agenda, the first of which, which I recall we spent at least two hours discussing, uh, was the immediate need to do something about human population. But that's a pretty big topic. So um, <laughs> we skipped over that, and, we th and then the next thing that we started ranting about over our lunch was domestic cats. So last year we had uh, a very... A very good set of public uh, presentations, actually. Celia Haddon spoke on behalf of the domestic cat, and she did so with aplomb. Her presentation was extremely good. And this was the purpose of our evening. We had uh, a gentleman from America who pointed out the, uh, the uh, fact that the cats could be a real nuisance, and um, we had Celia uh, pointing out the value of the cats on many, uh, on many levels. And then, of course, we had a lively discussion. We also talked about the value of wildlife per se. We made quite interesting contrast, like last year between the value of the life of a badger, currently at that, uh, being culled in the UK as it was last year on account of TB, and the value of a tiger that might have TB in India. Now, uh, that raised some, um, some, uh, some interesting discussion. One thing we touched upon last year at the end of our debate, thanks to Mark, who's one of our panellists again this evening, was the issue of hen harrier persecution in the UK. And that generated a lively response. So we thought we can't let the inertia uh, disappear. We must have another one of these evenings to talk about some apparently sensitive subjects. Why not let's, uh, let's choose birds and their hunting? And we better not just talk about mortar, where Bill and I have been in recent times looking at uh, some of our European fellows' attitudes towards this, because frankly our hands at home aren't clean either. And one of the things that was frequently pointed out to me by the Maltese, and rightfully so when I visited, is that uh, there are plenty of illegal activities taking place in your own country. Why don't you sort those out first before you come over here telling us what to do? And to be honest, there's a degree of uh, a point there. Let's be very clear about the purpose, though, and, and this comes from my heart. Um, the purpose of this is to raise topics of discussion, as I say, that we might not normally do so in a public forum. But that what we want to achieve is a creative debate, the emphasis being on the word creative <coughs> here. Because everyone in this room, no matter what, what opinion they hold, wants a result in their favour. It's wholly unrealistic, of course. It's idealistic. So what we have to have is effectively a creative uh, debate which leads to a constructive change and equally creative compromise. It would be nice to think that whatever opinions are expressed this evening and how heated and polarised they might be, that we all have enough fluidity in, in those opinions to make small changes in them. And if we do that, then there is some chance that we will gravitate closer together and be able to work in maybe effective partnerships in some sense to come to a solution. Ultimately, we all want a solution. It's unlikely we'll get the one that we all want, but we should sue for the best possible truce, uh, as long as it favours me. <laughs> Joke. Such a <laughs> strike that as a, as a piece of humour. Um, the... Uh, so that's it. That's what controversial conservation is all about. It's not really controversial. It's just a few topics of, uh, which were frequently on people's lips. Uh, we've invited a, a range of panellists. We've done our very best to get people who can speak about both sides of the argument. We hope to learn, uh, uh, certainly I do, um, um, from, from people's opinions this evening so that I might moderate my own and have a greater understanding of those. And I think we're going to kick off with a presentation from John, who's going to tell us a bit about the World Land Trust and how it... Uh, uh, has a, a view on hunting per se. And I think, gentlemen, we're going to step down from the stage so we can actually see what's going on, and we'll return in a, in a moment. Thanks very much, Chris. As you say, we started this idea um, over a lunch in queue, and Tonight I thought I ought to explain a little bit why I think this is relevant to the World Land Trust. So I'm going to show you a few sort of random images which explain why an organisation which is primarily based on um, land purchase has an interest in these issues. Um, the World Land Trust started 
1989, 25 years ago, as a single project to save the forests of Belize, which were about to be cleared for agriculture. Uh, this should be running by now. Is it? Yeah. Now, one of the reasons we focus on this area, because of these particular forests were the wintering ground for many of North America's migrant songbirds. And thanks to our Buy an Acre program, which was very innovative at its time, and it's now fairly complex, we were actually able to fund the purchase, um, ultimately with other organisations, 262,000 acres in Belize. As time moved on, we realised there were more and more hunting and poaching issues involved. Recently we've been working in Ecuador, and this video shows an Andean condor which was rescued as a young bird when it was injured and brought back to health and became very famous as the first ever Andean condor to be released into the wild with a satellite transmitter. In the first week of its release, it flew more than 150 kilometres. But then it was shot dead within a year. <coughs> Changing continents, we are now in Armenia. It's a country at crossroads with Asia and Europe. These are the famous Bezoar goats or ibex, massive horns and very, very popular with trophy hunters. In fact, most of the large mammals in Armenia are now threatened by hunting. And they are splendid horns, aren't they? The top predator of the Bezoar is a focus of a WLT project, and this is the Caucasian leopard, um, it's the largest subspecies of leopard, and they're thought to be less than 15 of them surviving in Armenia. In fact, they were believed to be extinct until we got um, this footage in this particular area on a camera trap. It's a beautiful, healthy leopard. But as you'll see in a few minutes, it's only got three legs. Our partners assume it was caught in a trap as a youngster, but they assure us it's a perfectly healthy leopard and per quite capable of hunting. Moving back to South America, we also work with indigenous communities. These are Azureo, and they are cooking an armadillo, which they caught and roasted alive. Um, so this brings another dimension, the ethics and the morality of the methods of hunting. The Ache group, who are hunters in other parts of Paraguay, some of the best bowmen in the world, their method of killing, like the Azureo, would not be acceptable. The arrow is designed to go straight through, or two-thirds way through, um, a monkey or a macaw and slowly bring it to the ground because it can't climb through the trees. These, Azure, these Gurani are singing a thanks to us because we have presented the land to them. And my dilemma is a lot of our supporters probably would not be happy with the way some of these people hunt, but there is a pressure to create community reserves. And to finish up with... I want to give you a short piece from one of our partner organizations explaining their relationship with hunting. Ahora trabajando y antes unos 3 a 4 años que yo empiece a trabajar con la Fundación Ecominga. Ahí ya me di de cuenta que yo hacía malo las cosas. Pero el el mono Para mí es un animal que me cambió la vida totalmente. Incluso fue una monita hembra que el momento que yo le disparé, ella estaba con bebé. Y cuando yo me fui a ver ahí herida, ella quejaba, es como una gente, lloraba, igual agrimeaba, que fue muy triste. Es cuando yo dejé la cacería. So as you'll see from these brief examples, the World Land Trust work increasingly involves working with communities to safeguard reserves. Now, the most obvious form of protection comes from having a presence on the reserve as this acts as a deterrent to would-be poachers. And the rangers themselves are usually members of the local community, and just with Jesus there, many were once hunters. Because of their knowledge, they can make excellent guides and invariably turn into some of the best ambassadors for conservation within their community. The transition is a simple one. By earning a wage, they become well-respected in the village, and instead of spending hours in the forest they, in search of something to kill, they are able to look after their families in a sustainable way. That's the easy bit. But there is the issue of respecting the traditions of indigenous communities and their hunting methods, a dilemma I find unresolved 
and probably unresolvable. I hope after you listen to this debate, you'll consider helping the World Land Trust by helping us to employ more keepers of the wild for our program partners and the reserves we've helped create. And that's my only fundraising plug for the evening. I'd now like to hand over to Gary Marvin, who is an academic anthropologist with a particular interest in the traditions of hunting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a social anthropologist, and um, my particular interest is in human-animal relations. I'll keep to time. I'd like to raise two related questions or suggestions in terms of these hotly debated issues over hunting and conservation. First, what is hunting as a social cultural practice? And second, in conservation debates and projects, is it useful to understand the perspectives, values and activities of hunters? And is there any value or need for conservationists to talk with or plan with hunters to bring them into projects? Conversely, is there any need for hunters to understand conservation perspectives and participate in conservation projects? So the first part, what is hunting? The work of an anthropologist is to understand particular social and cultural worlds from within, to reveal meaning from within rather than to impose meaning from the outside. And that's what I try to do with my research. Although there's a huge anthropological literature on hunting beliefs, values, practices in indigenous cultures where people might be classified as livelihood hunters, slightly better than subsistence hunters, where they need or prefer hunted meat. There is very little research on recreational or sports hunters, and it's these sorts of hunters that have been the focus of my research for some time. I think it's very important to explore the terms hunt and hunting because its forms are very differently configured. Matt Cartmill, an American anthropologist, has written, quote, hunting is not just a matter of going out and killing any old animal. In fact, very little animal killing qualifies as hunting. A successful hunt ends in the killing of an animal, although I will query that. Um, but it must be a special sort of animal that's killed in a specific way for a specific reason. So if we think about the terms hunt and hunting in terms of English practices, hunting is only used to refer to events in which hunted animals are pursued by a pack of hounds. Hunting is not, re used, to, is not used to refer to events in which people creep up on deer and shoot them. That's stalking. Waiting for pheasants to be driven over a line of people with shotguns is shooting. And those who have fish as their quarry do not hunt them, they fish them. OK. These are only terms, but they do indicate very different sets of relationships between human participants and the animals concerned. Hunting is not a monolithic thing or a uniform set of practices. Not all hunters are the same, and their motivations and aims are very different in different hunting practices. Back in the 1970s, Stephen Kellett, an American researcher, conducted a very large survey of hunters to see what sorts of beliefs and attitudes they had. And he suggested that hunters could be divided into three main types. This is an old survey, but I found it holds up pretty well for hunters now. The first he classified as utilitarian or meat hunters. These people thought of animals from the perspective of their practical usefulness, mainly meat. The second group he defined as dominionistic or sports hunters, who valued animals for the opportunities they presented for the hunter to show mastery and for the trophies they provided. And finally, there were nature hunters who were primarily interested in participation in nature in terms of being a predatory hunter themselves. Now, Keller alerts us not to read these as exclusive categories. He says, although the hunters tended to be orientated to one primary um, attitudinal relationship with hunting, they often had different attitudes. And my suggestion is that what is important for, under, for understanding hunting is that this is not simply a matter of attitude and all relation, but also a matter of attitude forming and guiding particular hunting practice. So rather than using these as types of classifications of hunters, I, in my work, find, uh, uh, find these uh, as different orientations to hunting itself. And different orientations might come to the fore on different occasions. So one of Kellett's um, 
ethical um, hunters, uh, sorry, uh, utilitarian hunters wanting meat might well have his or her ethical reasons for hunting, not simply trying to find cheap meat, but only eating hunted meat because they absolutely oppose the industrial livestock production of meat. Or a nature hunter may well um, only hunt and shoot an animal that is suitable as a trophy, but the way they hunt would be very different from the dominionistic hunter. In my work with hunters who describe themselves as ethical hunters, I've been interested in their codes about fair chase and what is acceptable or not acceptable in any hunting event. What initially surprised me is that these hunters, although they go out in the hope of killing an animal, killing is not much smoking about, spoken about and doesn't seem to be in the forefront of their minds. What is important to them is everything that goes before the kill, being in the forest, tracking, stalking, lying in wait, etc., etc. So what goes before shooting is the hunt. And for them, they're very clear that shooting is not part of the hunt. So these hunters would be satisfied with a hunting day even if they don't shoot anything. There are hunters who are certainly more focused on shooting and killing than they are in the complexities created by this ethics of fair chase. Interestingly, in conversation with hunters I know, these guys are referred to as shooters and not hunters. They're characterised as people who make no effort but use all means to kill their chosen animal. Significantly, they're condemned for hunting when the animal has no chance to escape. For most hunters, if an animal cannot escape from them on most occasions, this is not hunting. Okay, coming to a conclusion. I think it's important in any case where we're confronted with hunting in the context of uh, conservation, if we seek to understand hunting and not simply condemn it, that we should explore what sort of practice it is, how the animal's hunted, what values and beliefs the hunters have. What do they regard as acceptable or unacceptable process, uh, practices and processes? So we shouldn't just assume we know what hunting is. Of course, this assumes that one should or need to have dealings with hunters at all. One could simply take the strong moral position that the killing of animals for sport is morally repugnant, or stronger, that all killing of animals, for any reason other than those animals' best interests, ought to be banned. And we seek to make all forms of hunting illegal. Banning particular forms of hunting might not need any understand and understanding or dialogue at all. It might simply be a case of political, legislative, policing and draconian punishment powers. One simply wants to stop the hunt, force the hunters to stop what they are doing. And this is likely to create resistance, but that's another matter. However, conservationists might not have the power to simply ban hunting, as would be the case in many countries. So in any conservation project, I think a key issue is whether the advocates of conservation seek to ban all hunting of the species related to the project, or whether, even if they're morally opposed to hunting, are they willing to accept and incorporate some sort of notion of sustainable hunting. Equally, is there a way of hunters to discuss things with conservationists, even if they do not share the same values and goals of com conservationists? So, as a conclusion here, I think there is a complex of issues of, of how advocates of hunting and advocates of conservation treat, for example, scientific literature on the effects of hunting and scientific literature on sustainable hunting. However, I think it's more important, I think more important than what uh, scientists discover about the populations of a particular species in different re regimes of exploitation is the image that is important. Nels Paulson, an American sociologist who has studied hunting and cons conservation advocacy, comments, quote, scientific knowledge surrounding a species is not the essential problem for exploring how, for example, sustainable hunting can be more effective. Instead, it is the values, interests and moral beliefs of both hunters and anti-hunters which do not allow for a constructive discussion. This reflects a dominant divide between sustainable use and protectionism in global cons conservation advocacy. What Polson certainly shows in his research is that moral positions and particular val values related to nature 
make it difficult for different groups to communicate. I have my own academic anthropological interests in how these moral positions are configured and how different values um, related to or given to nature generate different activities in nature. So, for example, different values give rise to ecotourism, other values give rise to safari hunting, hunting safaris. However, I think it's not just for me an academic concern. I think that anthropological perspectives of understanding can be made use of in practical ways in projects that focus on managing how people engage with wild animals. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, we've all been uh, very polite and said that we don't want to be too controversial, um, so I'll say the same thing. Um, except right at the end, that's the bit that will be controversial. So most of what I say you can doze off for, if you like. I'm kind of laying the ground for the debate and for Andrew to come and uh, talk a bit later. So I'm going to talk about conflict, which is a real conflict between... Uh, a wonderful bird of prey called the hen harrier and grouse shooting. And note I say the conflict between hen harriers and grouse shooting, not a, hen, not a conflict between hen harriers and red grouse. Because hen harriers and red grouse live together in kind of ecological harmony, although the hen harriers do eat the red grouse and it's not the other way around, right around the world. It's only in bits of this country where we have invented a sport or a business called grouse shooting, where people will pay large amounts of money to go out and shoot red grouse, that there is a conflict between this bird of prey and a sport or a business, however you want to look at it. Sixty years ago, the Conservative government under Winston Churchill uh, passed the Protection of Birds Act that made the hen harrier and most other birds in the UK uh, fully protected by law. There are fewer hen harriers nesting in the north of England now than there were 60 years ago when they received full protection. So that doesn't look like progress to me. According to the science, and I don't think this is controversial either, I'm looking at Andrew to see whether he agrees with this, there ought to be about 2,600 pairs of hen harriers in the UK, and there are about 800. So two-thirds of the UK population is missing. The science also says that on areas that are predominantly managed for the sport or business of driven grouse shooting, there ought to be 500 pairs of hen harriers. And in 2008, there weren't 500, and there weren't 50, there were five. So that's a bit of a discrepancy. 500? Five. Five. Um, in England, again, the science says there ought to be 330 pairs of hen harriers, and this year there were about three and a half. There were three that everybody's admitting, and there's another one that's supposed to be a secret, so we won't mention that. So there were four, okay? So hen harriers are missing throughout the UK, and the reason that they're missing is that they eat red grouse, and they do. They eat lots of other things as well. They eat pipits and voles and all sorts of things, but they eat red grouse, and they eat red grouse before people want to shoot red grouse. So that's terribly unsporting of them. And the lack of hen harriers, despite the fact that they have full protection in law, is because people kill them illegally. And the people who kill them are the people who are interested in shooting red grouse. We do not see busloads of nurses leaving Sheffield at the weekend to go up into the Peak District to bump off hen harriers. There are not, despicable though they are, busloads of estate agents leaving Manchester to go into the forest of Boland to sort out the hen harriers. There aren't busloads of milkmen from York going up onto the North York Moors to kill off hen harriers. The only people who kill hen harriers are people who are interested in shooting red grouse. And it's not all the people who are interested in shooting red grouse, but I think we would all accept that really the only people who are killing hen harriers are those people who face this conflict with red grouse and them being eaten by hen harriers. So I said that there is nothing controversial so far. Okay? Now, I 
I honestly don't believe that... Um, uh, I don't have uh, a moral problem... Well, I do have a little bit of a moral problem, but I don't have a huge moral problem with people killing red grouse. It's not what I would want to do, but I can live with it. Um, so I'm not going to say that everything to do with the management of land for grouse shooting is bad, but then... I don't have to, to come to a view in saying that if you look at all the good things and all the bad things, which I think I've done, and you should do too, there's a very big pile of bad things, which include people killing hen harriers and peregrines and golden eagles, but also carbon loss, water discoloration, damage to blanket bogs, and a whole bunch of other things we haven't got time to go into. But there's some good things too, and I suspect Andrew might major on the good things, so I'm not going to do his job for him on that. But there are good things and bad things, and my view is that if you look at them, the bad things are a big pile and outweigh the good things. So what do you do about it? Well, usually in that type of situation where there is a conflict, you'd all sit down and have a chat about it and say, we're all on the same side, really, and we're all men and women of goodwill. We ought to be able to sort this out. If any of you say that this evening, I will strangle you. Because we've been doing that for decades. Don't come and tell me what we ought to do is sit down and have a chat about it. We have spent decades chatting about it, and it really hasn't worked. It hasn't made things better at all. Another thing you might say is, well, we need to improve regulation or policing or license grouse moors or do something that makes it more difficult for these bad things to go on. And that, that's a possibility. There are many good people who believe that that is the way forward. Um, and I used to think that was the way forward, but I have come to the view uh, that the simplest, cleanest, less bureaucratic, least bureaucratic, uh, most uh, efficient way to solve this problem is simply to ban driven grouse shooting. Because it's a very peculiar British occupation that we've only been doing for about 200 years. Nobody else in the world does it. Clearly nobody else needs it. We could live without it too. That's the controversial bit. Um, and to end... I've been quite quick, I think. To end, so I'll to say this bit a bit more slowly. To end, the reason I've come to that view, even though I am a wishy-washy liberal who really doesn't like banning things and looks at life and tries to say, well, there must be a way through this, good chat, we'll sort it out, bit of give and take, is that my experience, that although, and there are some of them in the room, my experience of... Um, uh, drinking claret with grouse moor owners has been entirely positive. Uh, but it hasn't been entirely positive in finding a solution to this particular conflict, where I am on the side of the hen harrier and the law, to be a bit prissy about it. Um, and I would say that all that chatting, all that trying to find a negotiated solution has failed, and that is because the grouse shooting community has two large a criminal element within its midst not everyone but too many of them and the grass shooting community has been too intransigent and it hasn't been able to clean up its act and it's had decades to do it and it's failed to do it and so we should do it so we should ban driven grass shooting that's my bit <laughs> <coughs> So, because, because I've probably forgotten all the good bits, Chris Packham's going to fill in now, sweep <laughs> up, and then Andrew Gilworth comes up here to say why we're both bonkers and wrong. Okay. This year we had the first National Hen Harrier Day. What motivated that was the fact that, as uh, Mark has said, we're now down to three and a half pairs of Hen Harrier. I suppose, if I can stray into the controversial, we've... You know, we no longer trust that part of the shooting fraternity. We've tried the dialogue, as Mark has suggested. We haven't got anywhere. We're down to three pairs. We haven't got a lot to play with anymore. Six gunshots could spoil everything forever in, the, in, 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 in England. So we called for our Hen Harrier Day, and we managed, with the threat of Bertha, 
uh, the dregs of a hurricane coming across the Atlantic to drag 570 people out into Derbyshire and uh, another, about 1,000 people overall. And we used social media. It was very cheap. We didn't spend a lot of money on this sort of thing. We haven't got a lot of money to spend on it because we're not, being, we're not the NGOs. We're not the RSPB. We're not the Wildlife Trust. It's Mark Avery with a bit of help from Chris Packham and quite a few other people. Birders Against Wildlife Crime. But we're not wealthy. So we just used Twitter and we used Facebook and we used YouTube. But we motivated a huge amount of interest. And at 10 o'clock on the Sunday of our Hen Harrier Day, more than 2 million people got a tweet about this issue. So from our point of view, that's a good thing because we now have the capacity to communicate instantaneously to people who we think might care about what we care about. Now, caring from my point of view is great, but it's not the solution. Action is the solution. So the action part of this was a petition that Mark had launched that he's already mentioned to ban driven grouse shooting. And when I looked this morning, I think about 16,400 signatures on that. 16,000 people are bothered and let's face it, it's, getting, it's tough to get people to bother to do anything online. Uh, they bothered to sign up to this petition. Now, I see that as a significant number. It's not a fantastic number. It's not the number that we would dream of or require. We need 100,000 to get more action out of government. But it is 16,000 people who are adamant enough to say they've had enough of dialogue, they no longer trust this faction of the shooting fraternity, and they want some action. And this is a plea for that action. The shooting fraternity have for a long time, in this instance, tried to convince us that managing grouse moors is good for conservation. My argument in this instance, and I'm being specific about driven grouse shooting, not shooting interest per se, let me be very, very clear about that. In this instance, that is no longer going to wash we have a far more sophisticated public to whom we are tweeting, who know full well that in order to raise grouse to the population levels required to drive them over guns to shoot them, unfortunately means not that conservation is in practice on these grouse moors, but that habitat and environmental damage are being caused. Draining of those bogs, the removal of not just hen harriers, but as many predators as possible. And in recent times, and I found this most shocking, on a couple of moors that I visited in Scotland, the total removal of mountain hares, not a predator, but an animal that's capable of transmitting a parasite which carries a disease which it might give to grouse. If that is this faction of the shooting fraternity's idea of conservation management in the 21st century, I'd like another planet. Because, frankly, that's not going to wash with me, nor the viewers of Springwatch. I'm sorry, that faction of the shooting fraternity, but our knowledge of ecology is sufficiently sophisticated these days to not believe you any longer. Please come into the 21st century, manage the rogues which are damning the reputation of the vast majority of responsible shooters in the UK, put an end to the illegal practice. I mean, yes... OK, Mark's been controversial. Called for a ban on the, uh, to end gr driven grouse shooting. But why? To prevent illegal activity. What's controversial about that? There can be no controversial um, activity when it comes to the fact that these birds are being killed illegally. That's it. Job done. Yes, we'd love to come back to the table. Just stop killing the birds illegally. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Where do you follow on after an act like that? When we talk, said that we wouldn't get too controversial too quickly, uh, but we seem to have done that uh, in, a, in a no time at all. And there's a particularly colourful view there uh, from both Mark and Chris, and some very real issues. And as Gavin said right at the, right at the beginning, many people are uncomfortable with the thought of someone walking across the countryside carrying a gun. Bear in mind that person will probably be dressed in a pair of sort of funny tweed trousers in the search of game to shoot it dead and take it home to eat it. Doesn't help. You go on to mention the conservation benefit. You've just seen the reaction. 
It all becomes too much, and the red mist descends. And so you have it. Controversial conservation. Every blogger's dream. Calls for bans. Calls for licensing. It's all great theatre. All this passion and prejudice before long gets in the way of all the facts. And what helps birds is cool heads. So what does the conservation, what does the evidence tell us? The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, or GWCT, has done much of the work that quantifies the biodiversity benefits of game management in the UK. We have 65 full-time scientists split fairly evenly across both game and wildlife who publish their science in the peer-reviewed literature. We've heard a lot of table thumping already, but I offer you three highlights that will probably get Mark and Chris leaping out of their chairs. But I'll give you three. When we did one study and we looked at farms that have a shoot and compared them with farms that don't have a shoot, guess what? The scientists found that on the farms that had a shoot, there were 25% more birds than the, the farms that didn't have a shoot. Another study when we went in to look at the woodlands and the woodlands that are managed for pheasants, they found there were 10% more overwintering birds than in the woods that weren't managed for pheasants. And lastly, if you came out of the woods and you looked at those funny cover crops planted down the side that normally squeeze, a farm manager allows them to squeeze somewhere in between the wood and his productive farm. The keepers have planted those to benefit his game, but the other wildlife joins in too. And they found that those cover crops will support up to 100 times as many overwintering birds than a neighbouring field of wheat. This is important because this conservation effort is being achieved alongside existing land use, alongside the farms, alongside the forestry blocks, those very fields that provide the food for us and the timber we need. It's also happening on a large scale. The area of land shot over in the UK is roughly 10 times the size of our nature reserves combined. With nature in trouble, that was a significant conservation effort. Right at the beginning, Chris talked about needing some imagination and having to stretch ourselves. I feel it's controversial that so many conservationists choose not to embrace or encourage best practice in game management. So are we letting our passions and our prejudices get in the way? Since it is real, practical conservation. Let me illustrate its further use. When DEFRA began encouraging farmers to adopt agricultural environment schemes to benefit nature across our countryside, they came up with 36 arable options. Six are entirely based on our game management research, and a further 23 were strongly influenced by it. So we do use this game management knowledge just don't mention it. I find that controversial. Why is it that we want to be so risk averse? We discussed right at the beginning that we should perhaps be, take greater risks. Why don't we actually talk about it more openly? Am I suggesting that game management is perfect? Of course not. But it's best it is magnificent and perhaps has a huge amount to teach us. We do have a very large number of pheasants and partridges released into the countryside each year. And some are beginning to claim that it's doing huge damage. I don't believe it. Common sense suggests that if that was the case, we'd start finding the evidence. And some things we could do better. We need to find a solution to the genuine conflict in between hen harriers and red grouse. The conflict was demonstrated on a driven grouse moor at Langham in between 1992 
1997. This is the joint findings of both our work and the RSPB and a joint study together. What happened? The hen harrier numbers rose from 2 to 20 pairs in six years before shooting was abandoned because the hen harriers had eaten over a third of all the grouse chicks that had hatched. With no grouse shooting, the local culture, economy and employment suffered without gamekeepers controlling the generalist predators because they had ceased. But what happened after that? Well, by 2003... So only five years later, about 20 harriers. What had happened to them? Well, guess what? They were back down to two. The number of breeding grouse and waders had more than halved. Why did the population tumble? The gamekeepers were no longer there to give these ground nesting birds the protection that they needed. Grouse mill managers feared that their worst fears had just been proven. This was a real lose-lose situation. Don't think necessarily, um, I'll just take one line from this joint study, any more with similar, similar characteristics to Langham may suffer the same fate. That's a joint piece of work with the RSPB. We know that grouse moors are a haven for, for wader birds. We know this because of the, the British Trust for Ornithology's mapping. And the GWCT were concerned about these dramatic falls in wader bird populations at, at Langham when the keepers left. So between 2000 and 2008, we studied curlew, golden plover and lapwing on an experimental basis, looking at keepered and unkeepered moors. What did the science tell us? Predation control, as normally undertaken by a gamekeeper, improved the breeding success of these scarce breeding birds by an average of three and a half times. That was the good bit. What was the bad bit? Where the keepers had left. Where the keepers had left them more at the toss of a coin, the scientists discovered that each year the number of wader birds dropped by 17%. Or over 10 years, that would equate to 84%. Don't just take GWCT, published science in the Journal of Applied Ecology, which said that. Only this year, the RSPB published a paper in the Journal of Applied Ecology, also on wader birds, and it identified exactly the same issues. And I'll read you one line from that. Curlew populations and curlew nesting success, known to be a key driver of population trends, was also positively related to gamekeeper density. This matters. As the RSPB recently highlight, highlighted, from an international perspective, the curlew is the UK's highest conservation priority bird species. We host over 25% of the global population, but they're in trouble. If grouse moors are one of the few places that the curlew, curlew's breeding range remains stable, I would suggest that an 84% reduction would be a disaster. It is also worth noting that in West and South West Scotland, the Isle of Man and in Wales, they are looking how, but how they can encourage more grouse shooting to try and reverse these disastrous population falls because they are looking at the evidence. So, if all this evidence has been gathered, why is this a problem in England? Why is Mark and Chris talking about the work that led to Hen Harrier Day? Well, for me, it's back to those people carrying the guns in the funny trousers and the descending red mist. Because at that very moment, all this evidence, that goes. That goes out, and out in come the megaphones. Sides are taken. Passion and prejudice 
starts taking centre stage. And through this red mist, obscure reasons are shouted. Let me give you some. Number one. The shooting community is in denial about a legal killing of hen harriers. I don't see that, and I don't hear it. There's a vast body of evidence which actually says that is exactly what is happening. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust contributed to that in a scientific paper in 1998. I'll read you the first line from the abstract from Dick Potts's paper. In the UK, a full recovery of hen harriers, breeding numbers, is prevented by illegal culling by some gamekeepers who fear the species threatens the future of grouse moors. Second one. All we need to do is a bit more diversionary feeding. Well, we've been working at this one for years with the RSPB and we still can't get it to work on its own. It is part of a solution, but it is not the entire solution. And yes, there is a scientific paper written up by both of us which says that. The third one, my favourite, and Mark has been able to help us with this today, that there is no plan. DEFRA doesn't have one and doesn't intend to have one. Well, the talking may have been going on for years, but in 2012, DEFRA brought together a subgroup to achieve a recovery plan for hen harriers. Who's on that? The RSPB, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, the National Gamekeepers Organisation, the Moorland Association, which is a representative group of, of moor owners, Natural England, and the National Parks Authority. And that subgroup jointly reported back to DEFRA in November last year. Lastly, the fourth one. If we're going to have this joint plan, that would involve working with criminals. To those of you that have an objection to this, I say to you, grow up. Find some more imagination. There are few conflicts anywhere that have been resolved by not actually moving on. I know. My father was in the armed services and I had the pleasure of having an armed policeman living in our house most of my childhood. I had the pleasure of my Christmas presents being opened by the bomb squad long before I ever saw them. When our government signed the Good Friday Agreement, I saw it as an utter betrayal. But I was wrong. I was utterly wrong. I was part of the problem. And that takes us to what are we going to do now? How are we going to break this lose-lose cycle? I've mentioned what had happened at Langham Moor. Where we let the hen harrier numbers climb, and then we lost the waders, we lost the grouse, we lost the jobs, we lost 25% of the heather, five keepers were made redundant, the hotels lost their bookings, oh, and we lost all the hen harriers too. Don't just rely on the Langham study. Don't worry, the evidence keeps coming. This is Sky this year, published in, British, in Scottish Birds. I'll read you a line from the abstract. There was little evidence that adult hen harriers can successfully defend their young against an incursion by a fox, either by daylight or in darkness. What a shame they didn't have a gamekeeper to help them. So what are we going to do? Well, remember that all sides are united. They want more hen harriers. There's so much wildlife conflict around the world where you don't actually have that unity. If you read Gavin's book on wolves and the reintroduction into Yellowstone Park, the conflict was between those that did want the wolves and those that didn't want the wolves, and it took them a long time to sort that out. This is not the case in England. All sides want more hen harriers. And so if you let this red mist blow away and you put all the passion and the prejudice to one side, you will find a DEFRA six-point plan. Within that plan includes 
And one of those elements is a captive rear and release of hen harriers. It's worked well in France for the last 15 years for Montague harriers, and it breaks the lose-lose cycle. How does it work? The captive rear and release would avoid the losses. It would allow the first nest of hen harries to settle on a moor. And if the second nest is within 10 kilometres of the first nest, then that, those chicks would be taken into an aviary for six weeks before then being released. So no hen harries are harmed. So there we have it. Thank you. So there we have it. A hen harry plan has been written and could be put in place for the next breeding season. There's just one small problem. DEFRA haven't published it. And so I'd encourage those of you that would like to see it to sign the petition. We started asking for it to be published. And if we choose not to let our passions and our prejudices get in the way of finding a way forward, not all controversy, not all conservation has to be controversial. Thank you for listening. showing a little bit of film first, yes? So I'm told? Yeah. yeah? This is a little bit of a uh, tiny edit of a film I made in Malta. This mysterious... Uh, this um, is Malta. I'm talking. It's Shut in up. the Mediterranean. To the south is Africa. To the north is Europe. And every year, uh, lots and lots and lots of British tourists come here to enjoy the fabulous weather, like today, and the rather impressive views, and the very, very affable people. There's also some, um, some other visitors that come to Malta every year, in spring and autumn. Literally millions of migrant birds. You know, I don't think there's anything in the whole of nature that is more mysterious and more exciting to witness than migration. I mean, it's such a story. Come on, I mean, little tiny birds have flown down to Africa to spend the winter. Then, this time of the year in spring, they start moving north. And they're off to North Europe, possibly to Britain to actually breed. And, of course, it's a heck of a journey and they're going to be absolutely exhausted. So every now and again, they think, oh, I, I, we need a rest, we need to stop, we need to feed, you know, fuel up, as it were. And, um, well, imagine the scene, birds struggling over the sea, and it finally gets to land, and it sees a lovely green valley, just what it wants. And, oh, look, people to greet it. Something like a thousand or more hunters with guns who have a little motto, and it is, if it flies, it dies. It looks quiet enough now, but actually, we're being watched, and the birds are being watched at the Rani. If we look over the hillside, you can see, well, little hides. And they come in all, whoops, two. birds are being shot out of the sky they don't retrieve all of them so it's many of the birds that are shot are out in that countryside um, just just lying around waiting to die so there is an element of animal cruelty and it has a huge inf impact on conservation as well I mean is the injuries what I see is m most of them or 90 percent of them are shotgun injuries most of these in injuries are wing injuries or sometimes the leg of the bird yeah and this um, open fractures. The bird is bleeding from the wound and um, very often even I can see the bone sticking out of the, of the wound. So it's, uh, these are really, really painful injuries. And I mean, even if they arrive here uh, shortly after the injury, it's uh, definitely the bird is uh, greatly, suffering greatly. 
Maybe there's a morning coming when the shooters on Malta will come out and look around and realize there's no birds left to kill. That must not happen. I'd like to thank the League Against Cruel Sports and BirdLife Malta for helping make this film. Now you see, when you make a little film like that, or any film, when you go over there and you're actually present and so on and so forth, and you, you bump into various Maltese people, of course, you have to maintain a certain degree of etiquette. We don't assume everybody's guilty, but when you get back here, you might have a slightly different view, because and in the film I noticed I said, and some lovely, affable people. Now, I've got to tell you that the hunters in particular, and perhaps even beyond that, I don't know, I was talking to a journalist just the other day who said, oh, yes, I worked in Malta for a couple of years. And I said, what did you think? And he said, they're bloody weird. <laughs> Not a joke, unfortunately. I wish it were, because, but I agree with him. We'll get to that in just one moment more specifically. But uh, the one thing I really, really want to stress, first of all, I would like to say that to me... The miracle of migration is one of the most fantastic things about nature on Earth, whether it's that side of the Atlantic, birds coming from South America up to North America, or it's this side coming from Africa up to Europe, including Britain. There are millions and millions and millions of birds make this incredible journey. Many of them travel at night. They can navigate by the stars. You know, whether you believe in a creator or whatever, if you do, he did a bloody good job when he came up with migrants. It, to me, is one of the most precious things in nature, and it should be sacrosanct. It's as simple as that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it is not just in Malta that this is going on. You've really got to realise what a scale it is. There's uh, several of those countries. They're all around the Mediterranean. Cyprus is probably the next worst. It's difficult to make a, uh, a black league, as it were. Cyprus is dreadful. There is shooting. But in to on top of that, you've got this lime stick business where they put this sticky stuff on the bushes. The birds get stuck. They just dangle there. They lie there. Some of them die there. But eventually somebody will come along, break the necks, take them away, sell them to a restaurant. It's unbelievable. Uh, but worse still, they have now got hold of modern technology. They've got hold of mist nets. Scientists in this country, ringers, use them to catch birds. I've done it myself years ago. It's fantastic. Uh, but these are using the mist nets to catch millions and millions of birds in these different countries every year. Cyprus, they use a lot of them. Many of them are on the sovereign bases, which are supposedly British. And I promise you, there's another thing. You come away from Malta and Cyprus and you realise they bloody hate the British. There's history there. They regard us as an enemy. And I think that's absolutely true. We're there coming and interfering. Uh, the other countries, one of uh, Egypt seems to be turning into one of the worst of the lot. Far less information from there, but I've seen photographs of, I couldn't believe this statistic, it said something like 60 kilometres of mist nets stretched along the coastline, just line after line after line after line, a great big invisible wall for migrant birds to smack into, and they are not going to escape from that. And, in fact, the technology extends again there because a lot of those birds are quail. They probably do get eaten, in fact, but there ain't much meat on a quail. And, in fact, they're lured into the nets, as on Malta, by a call, by having a recording which is constantly going the whole time. Even in the middle of the night, you go in Malta, you can hear... Which you'll all recognise as a quail. But so far, it's obvious there's no Maltese in the audience, otherwise I would have been shot. Got away with that one. Um, there are some of the other countries. Um, France still has areas which are pretty bad. Spain still has areas which are pretty bad. Georgia, apparently. Um, uh, and, 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 and Italy, in fact, is, is, is a tiny little soup zone of hope. Because Italy used to be the place... You know, I remember being, when I first got interested in birds, and that's, oh, we don't want to go to Italy, they just shoot everything. In fact, I did go to Italy about seven or eight years ago and was very pleasantly surprised. And generally, the news I get from the Italian NGOs is that it's not perfect, there's still stuff going on, but it is getting better. 
And to a certain extent, there's a feeling that maybe the hunters are getting a bit bored with this. There's not enough birds. It's not that much fun. It's ironical, because if you shoot them all, <laughs> wipe, out, wipe out the hunters as well. Uh, what the Italians tend to do is go on expeditions. And they, many of them actually go to Ireland in particular during the winter to shoot woodcock and snipe and that kind of thing. And they probably end up on the grouse moor, so I'm told. Never been on one myself. But I gather it's at the Italian accent is well known up there. So you've got all those different countries. They're all around the Mediterranean. And it set me thinking, um, has anything got any better, apart from perhaps in Italy? Has anything been done before? Well, this isn't very encouraging news, but many people here will remember the Stop the Massacre campaign, which I believe is still actually out there somewhere. Stop the Massacre referred to killing birds in the Mediterranean. And this first arose, I would think, in the 60s or 70s or something like that. And so there was a massive interest in it then. Uh, I used to go to Cyprus quite a lot back in the 1980s, and it tended to be not so much the bird societies as Friends of the Earth who were leading the way to try and do something about it. And I remember at that time, one time in the, in the 80s, going to Cyprus, and it, it, people were a little bit more optimistic because they said, education, that's the answer. We must teach the young people that killing birds is bad and watching birds and photographing birds is good and very enjoyable and much better. People will like you for it, and so will the birds. And uh, so various schools, um, various school programs were set up, and people would go around and show them charts of all the birds and say, we've seen these, we've seen these, and a big education program. There was even a referendum. The RSPB actually paid for it back in the 80s, a referendum to ban spring shooting. And for a year or two, it was. But you go back to Cyprus now, it's worse than ever. Those things simply have not worked. This is sacrilege, I know, sacrilege in a room full of conservationists, but teaching children the right way, that ain't going to do it. It's not going to do it in anything. You know, it's better than teaching them the wrong way. I'm not saying scrap it. I'm not saying scrap the Young Ornithologist Club or whatever it's become these days. The Young Red Squirrel Club, by the look of it. But anyway, that's another one. It's, um, but, you know, no, it is, I, I would never knock people working with kids and everything else, but they're not the ones that are going to change it. They simply can't. And chances are, particularly these days, with all the distraction technology, it's likely, likely enough that they probably won't even get into birds. It might be for a bit, but then they'll drop in and so on and so forth. And um, there's also laws. Many, nearly all, as has been already mentioned, nearly all the... Um, hunting, we call it, hunting. None of the things I've mentioned fit the definition of whoever said that definition of hunting. You know, it takes no, there's, there's no skill involved apart from from those Maltese guys sitting there in an armchair in many cases. You know, that's, that's all they do. It's target practice. That's all it is. Lime sticks and mist nets. That's not hunting either. So basically, the definition of hunting... Uh, around the Mediterranean is, is actually killing birds either totally for fun or to a certain extent possibly an income to be made in Cyprus in particular. Do we take that into, into account? I really don't know. But they sell these little tiny birds, they get pickled uh, and sold in the restaurants and they presumably make some sort of income. But none of it is hunting in that sense, really. Um, so... What other things have, have these countries in common, I thought? Well, the shooters are always male. They're always men. Never seen a woman with a gun. Always male, always done up like Rambo. The macho thing is in common in any of those countries. They'll be there in the sort of uh, camouflage suits and have cross belts, Nice little moustache, usually. They strike poses, big boots, and a great big gun. So that's one thing it's definitely about. Nearly always macho. Um, there's, uh, the other thing is, of course, that they're hot countries. I don't know whether that's anything to do with it. The other thing is, and I wonder whether there's some hope here at all, that most of them I would call, and Malta is a very good example of this, I would call religious countries, particularly Roman Catholicism, compared with perhaps Britain anyway. 
So my suggestions, and uh, nothing has worked so far, so maybe these things are worth a bash. The um, one is that we need to involve local personalities. I mean, no disrespect to either myself, disrespect either to myself or to Chris. We went over there, but we'd better go over there too often because we would be labelled as interfering British people, foreigners coming over. They desperately, each of these countries, need to find some people known to whichever country we happen to be in and to make a fuss. You know, a Bridget Bardo figure or something like that. Um, and I also think, and I really mean this, I think it's worth a bash of um, petitioning, if that's the right word, the Pope. Because Malta is a very Roman Catholic country. How would it be if the Pope came out and said, all these birds, the miracle of migration, is God's creation, and you are destroying it. You disrespect it, you kill it, you don't care about it. And in fact, I know this seems unlikely, but at the bird fair, the, um, the Pope wasn't actually there. <laughs> but, 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 there was a representative of a sort of inter-church group, and there were some Catholics there, Catholics for birds or something like that, I don't know what it's called. And he did say that Pope Francis, who is named, or named himself, after Francis of Assisi, does intend to take on environmental matters in the next wave of papal edicts, or whatever it is. So I really don't see any harm at all in a barrage of letters coming from Britain or tweets or whatever you want um, saying, please, 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 this is right on your doorstep. It won't make a difference in all those countries, but it just might be some sort of lead. It's worth a try. Because what the hell else we do, I simply don't know. We will be back with the League Against Cross Sports, small deputation here, I know, in uh, a couple of weeks' time, actually, so I'm, uh, you may not see me again, really. It's, it's, it could be farewell. Um, and uh, one thing, actually, I think I would say here, if you think which of the NGOs are, over the years have really achieved something, really achieved something, not just in habitat retainment or anything like that, but really achieve something, really stop something iniquitous. Which of them have done that? Not just birds, everything. And I would say that League Against Cruel Sports would come very high in that list. They were very much the leaders in getting fox hunting banned. They know what it takes, and it's not a pretty process, but I know they will be considering that and trying to apply that to this situation in Malta and hopefully in the rest of the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, it's a bloody disgrace. Thank you. Chris, do you want to say anything? Otherwise, up. I, I just I visited Malta early in the year uh, along with Bill, and I'll just conclude by bringing you up to date with what's happening in the democratic process. Um, but recent polls indicate that 60 to 65 percent of the Maltese people uh, disapprove of the spring hunting to the extent that they've actually called for a referendum in that country. They've only previously called for. I think two previous recommend, uh, referendums. One was about abortion, Catholic country, big issue, and the other was about divorce, big issue. Um, so it, it is a significant thing. Um, unfortunately, it, it appears that the, the contemporary government is doing every, everything it can to thwart the democratic process of this referendum um, and undermine its ability to succeed. The politics of Malta are what you know, lead to the, uh, the continuing hunting issue there. Uh, in very simple terms, they enjoy very high turnout at any election, up to 95%, which is commendable, of course. Uh, they have two principal parties, and the margin between either winning a victory is very, as and his, has, historically has always been very narrow. So basically, um, not to put too fine a point on it, the, uh, the incumbent government bought the block vote of the hunters um, and their families and their support. So it might seem an insignificant number in an electorate of somewhere between 325 and 345,000 people, uh, 10,000 hunters and their families, but when the margins are narrow, it's worth the vote. So, to be honest with you, the incumbent government are doing their duty. They are honouring the pledge they made for that, uh, for that fraternity that gave them their block vote. 
Um, the referendum will now probably take place in spring, after the spring hunting season. It's been separated from local council elections, where, which would have seen a very high turnout. Unless 50% of the eligible electorate actually vote in the referendum, then whatever the result, it's invalid. So obviously trying to get people out just to vote about spring hunting in this instance is a lot more difficult than taking advantage of the fact that they were all coming out to vote in their local council elections, which have been mysteriously delayed by a year. Um, what I would like to see, and one thing, our, our mutual campaigns in the spring were very successful, is some um, support from the British shooting and hunting fraternity. Um, I, nothing, no one can condone this. There's not anyone in this room with a shooting interest. Whatever your opinions of hen harrows and grouse, let's just lay that to rest for a moment. Watching swallows and swifts and up to 15 other species of birds which visit the UK to breed every summer, cuckoos and the like of that, being shot, as Bill says, by men in armchairs, not even bothering to stand up to shoot them, is not sport. And there won't be a responsible shooter in the UK that could possibly condone that, obviously. So please, next spring, when we run our campaign, if there are members of the BASC, uh, people who write for the Shooting Times, why not stand up with us and oppose this sort of hunting? That's not going to do you any harm. That will add to your credibility. And on this inst uh, in, in that instance, we would be very keen to immediately partner you because we are both, uh, I'm sure, keen to stamp out the practice of illegally killing these birds. One other thing is that um, you may wonder, with Malta being a, a member of the European Union, why nothing has been done uh, through the process of um, the European Commission. Well, for the last seven years, we've had either a sympathetic or apathetic commissioner for the environment there. He is leaving his post at some stage in the near future. We will have a new commissioner, and our plan for forthcoming campaigns, certainly from my point of view, I'm not sure about Bill and the League, um, is to put uh, public pressure onto the European Commission to therefore put political pressure directly on the Maltese government, and hopefully at some stage in the near future we'll have a democratic solution. I'm optimistic personally. I know Bill wasn't uh, that optimistic there, but with 65% of the Maltese people opposed to this practice, surely it's only a matter of time. Uh, thank you to all our panellists. Thank you for keeping to time. We've actually made up five minutes, so I'm lopping five minutes off your interval as well. Uh, so we uh, will be back here at 8.40 uh, promptly, which will give just a little bit more time for questions. Um, just, I mean, very briefly, we've heard about the massive decline uh, of waders, wading birds where keepering has been stopped. We've heard about 99% of the hen harriers missing from uh, uh, England. Uh, we've heard about the results of Langham, which were des described as a lose-lose, lose your waders, lose your harriers, lose your jobs. And I think what we face and what I'd like you to focus on when it comes to the questions is, uh, well, how do we turn that lose-lose-lose into a win-win where we actually get... Uh, waders and uh, harriers and then of course we've had the uh, uh, problem which I have spent my lifetime on which is how you stop uh, the killing of uh, migrant birds and I and, and Bill uh, hypothesized that it was it might might be something to do with hot countries the bad news is that the Greenlanders treat their seabirds with much the same uh, 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 way of carrying on um, it is a problem, um, and I'm looking to you tonight for solutions, basically, because I think all our speakers said we've tried a lot and we don't know what the solutions are. <laughs>